In April next year, Leif Johansson will retire as AstraZeneca's non-executive chairman, marking the end of more than a decade-long journey that's seen the global drug giant weather many a storm with as many milestones, including, of course, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Earlier this year, the company completed the delivery of 3 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine just 18 months after inking its partnership for manufacturing with the University of Oxford. To discuss his experience and learnings from arguably the biggest challenge that the pharmaceutical industry industry has faced in more than a century, the status of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 and of course plans for India. Joining me today on the Global Dialogue is the man himself, Leif Johansson. Uh, thanks very much and appreciate you joining us here on the show. Uh, the experience of being able to put this vaccine in the market in a very short time because there have been concerns on how much you can speed up science. But it's not just speed, it's also been scale. Uh, what have been the key learnings from the pandemic for you? I think there are many learnings there. Uh, the first one perhaps is that when it comes to innovation, we as a company, but also academia, or for that matter, governments, need to find new ways to cooperate. In our case, the fact that we got a question from Oxford University whether we could help industrialize and commercialize the vaccine was a new question to us, and we said yes to that. But then we were able to roll out also, and together with Serum Institute of India here in India at a very large scale, but also in, in 15 almost other places around the world. And of course, that meant that we could roll out commercially, industrially at speed. Uh, and then I think also uh, there's a lesson there that normally uh, a combination of academia, companies, corporations and, and government can learn from that by saying we can probably do 2x or 3x bigger, greater speed. In your experience, what is the way to bring in access? What is the way to bring in equity? How do we arrive at access and equity uh, while this vexed issue of IP continues to be debated and discussed? Well, I think it's important to realize that IP is the basis for our industry in the sense of creating innovative medicines or vaccines. And therefore, uh, it's a cornerstone of, of the cooperation between governments and, and companies. Uh, we spend about, the industry spends about 250 billion US dollars per year in re research and development. All of that actually comes from uh, the, the selling of the drugs that we are now in an innovative patented phase on. But having said that, it is also important that there is an opportunity to think differently at different unique times. We felt that this pandemic was unique enough to justify a not-for-profit decision, but also uh, a very strong uh, uh, spreading of technology and technology uh, transfer into many countries. Uh, and, though, and this is a very unique experience, it's a unique situation, and then we can do unique things. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that industry needs to be able to generate uh, revenue to be able to fund um, f research for future medicines. Take me through, uh, you know, the, the, the debate and discussion within the organization as you arrived at the decision to take the not-for-profit route. Right. No, I, the, the obvious uh, trade-off there really is that uh, to, to take the long-term effects of needing to, re to get revenue uh, at reasonable profits to be able to fund future medicines and vaccines, versus short-term trying to solve a, the world's problem. And that obviously is a delicate balance. In, in this case, we at AstraZeneca decided that this was a unique enough situation to stay away from the principles and focus on really getting things done uh, in a short while. And, and obviously the fact that we did technology transfer, but also the fact that we did for no profit, made it easy to work around the world. So we ended up delivering 3 billion doses of vaccine in more than 180 countries. And of course, that's something that we think is good uh, and that we are proud of. 
What do you take away from the fact that on the distribution side, there has been a significant setback? No, I think there, there is a very valuable uh, learning there, and that is that we as a pharmaceutical company, we can uh, research and develop uh, and industrialize a medicine or a vaccine, uh, but we cannot actually get it directly to patients. For that, we require good uh, primary care systems and healthcare systems that can operate around the world in the most e efficient way. Uh, and I think we, are, we have different roles here. Uh, we as a company, we can provide very good, transparent, um, non-partial, good um, information about what we are doing, what the effects of our vaccine uh, in this case actually was, etc. But then regulators will need to be able to deal with that in, mm. in, in a very good and efficient way such that citizens in their countries can feel in, uh, the, the trust of, of that whole system. And then finally, we actually need a lot of nurses uh, in many different parts of the world to be able to get those injections into the arms of patients. How important will uh, India be, will Indian partners be for AstraZeneca going forward? I think they will be very important. I think we have a realization. We knew that before, and we knew Serum Institute of India before also. But we have certainly learned that there is a capability and a sophisticated cap capability here in India to be able to produce vaccines and even medicines uh, for the world. And I think that's something that we in India, and we are part of Indians, Indians should be proud of. What does the innovation pipeline for AstraZeneca look like from here on? Well, we have just released what we call the bold ambition, and that is to continue on the basis really of, of uh, three different aspects of our industry or in science. We, we, have all, we have a greater understanding of genetics, we have a very good understanding on the immune system, and we know how um, cells actually individually almost work and take up uh, both energy and, and medicines. All of that combines into something that we call druggable science. It means that it is science that you can make drugs from. Mm. So I think we have a very exciting 10 years ahead of us when it comes to be able to um, continue to grow uh, with innovative products. And that's across oncology, it's cardiovascular, it's renal uh, and intestinal disease, uh, all of very big, interesting areas for us. You know, let's move away from pharma and talk about uh, business in general. Uh, as we close out 2022, the world was already in the midst of a very fragile recovery. And then, of course, we've seen uh, the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war uh, that's had an economic impact across uh, the world at this point in time. Uh, what is your sense? Uh, are you anticipating a protracted, long, deep recession? Or do you believe that at least for large parts of the world, it's likely to be a soft landing, a mild recession? Well, we, we do have a very tragic war going on in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and of course, that uh, the immediate effects are for the tragedy of, of people involved in that. But there is secondary effect, and especially so in the energy sector. So I think we can expect for a somewhat difficult winter ahead of us. I think probably coming towards the end of next year, we might have been able to find other sources of energy in such a way that we will not have that immediate effect, that immediate cooling off effect. So hopefully, from an economic point of view, things will go back uh, to a better situation, lower inflation, uh, etc. And hopefully the war can end. Mr. Johansson, uh, a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 on the Global Dialogue. We wish you the very best of luck and appreciate you joining us here on the show. Thank you very much. Well, that's it then on this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.